Hi, I'm Margaret at Miller Guide, and today I have a special guest. Brenda's here to share with all the viewers her life with compression fracture. I initially asked Brenda to share her story because out of all the individuals that I've worked with with compression fractures, despite the fact that she has several compression fractures, she is very positive. She is so perseverant. Um, she does every single exercise I ask her to do and more and she comes back with her checklist all done up and and asking me really specific questions. However, when I asked her, she, she's so uh, fastidious about everything she does, when I asked her to prepare for today's talk, she wrote everything out. And it wasn't until she wrote down her story that I realized how frustrated and how much despair and anger there was in her dialogue. So I've asked her not to share so much that part, but rather the parts that have worked and that have helped her. And so today's story is, in sharing Brenda's story, is to help all of those individuals, men and women, with compression fractures who are suffering in silence. Brenda's a retired teacher. She has always enjoyed gardening, um, bi-weekly exercise classes, walking every day. She realized as early as in her 30s that she needed to look after her bones. Her mom had fractured both hips and her pelvis. So Brenda already had a bit of a red flag against her in terms of her bones but in, when it comes to genetics. A routine DEXA in 2011 showed that Brenda had um, some bone loss. She was diagnosed with osteopenia. And so she began to even be more careful, you know, watching the calcium in her diet, vitamin D, um, continuing her exercise classes. Her GP considered her for bisphosphonates, but she couldn't tolerate them, so then she switched to prolia. She was on prolia for four years, and a repeat DEXA showed that she had improved, so she was discontinued uh, in the spring of 2015. So she was excited, she was going to start planning a big trip that her and her husband had um, hoped to always do to Africa. And so it was their dream holiday, a five week trip. Um, unfortunately that dream holiday soon became a nightmare. And on day one, when she was moving the heavy bags, she got some severe back pain. She was able to manage it. She had taken some uh, over-the-counter pain medication with her and by the time the trip ended, she was in severe pain. The more potholes she hit, the, the worse her pain got. And so as soon as she returned to Canada, she got in to see her doctor. Unfortunately, he diagnosed her with a strained back. Um, but the therapist that she saw within, within the few days suggested a second opinion, suggested um, x-rays, both of which she went on to do and was diagnosed with a 70% compression fracture of T9 and four other vertebrae having some level of compression. And so um, Brenda's here to share with us the things that have helped her and her journey with compression fractures. So Brenda, my first question for you to share with the audience is, what was the treatment that you received after you did get the diagnosis of a vertebral fracture, or fractures, I should say? Um, initially, I was given um, much stronger painkillers, and that really helped with uh, managing the pain, but it also allowed me to sleep with just, I was knocked out, basically. And then the second thing, or the initial physiotherapy that I had also helped again with the pain management. I had um, hot pads. I had those little electrical pulses that stimulate the muscles, acupuncture, and then there was a minimal amount of ultrasound. And that initially helped with just the general pain. And either the your physician that you saw that gave you the diagnosis or the, your initial therapist, did anybody share with you that your compression fractures could actually get worse by how you moved? No, no, and I, I didn't even know that uh, with my T9 that I had lost 70% that, that um, it couldn't be fixed either. Yeah, and that fixing of your T9, by the way, um, which could have been an option, but only 
Generally, it's an option within the first six to eight weeks after a compression fracture. It's something called a vertebral plasty or kyphoplasty, where they reinflate the vertebra with kyphoplasty and then inject a form of cement into the vertebral body. But a lot of people don't know, although it can give you pain relief, it doesn't actually um, stop the progression of further fractures. So you're, the importance of good body mechanics and of uh, uh, um, being um, diligent with your exercises is still really important despite having that type of intervention. Yes, and I, I was told that it could be detrimental as well because it would make one strong section with weaker bones around it. That so that, that was just a reality check. Yes. Yeah. Um, how have your vertebral fractures changed your lifestyle? Well, I went from uh, white to black, a 100% change in my life. As you said, I was the Energizer Bunny. I was involved in the Community Association, University Women's Group. I did things at home like refinishing furniture for my daughter. I was just engaged in lots and lots of activities and I could do nothing but sleep either in the bed or on a chair. I just, it was a hundred percent change because of the pain. Um, in terms of gardening, I, I've had to hire some young women to help me with the garden now because it's, gardening is hauling and lifting and lifting and more lifting and heaving and shoveling and all those things that are bad for your back, which I probably didn't help my back previously, but uh, um, all I can do now is deadhead plants. So, um, so that it was a stress reliever before, now it's a stress. <laughs> um, and I'm one of those odd people that likes to clean. Again, it's sort of a feel-good thing, but uh, I've had to hire a cleaning lady to help me with the heavy stuff the vacuuming, the washing of the floors, the toilets, all those things that, that uh, put extra strain on my back. I can do a little laundry now, but ironing is um, really, really hard. So I've embraced the uh, rumpled linen look. <laughs> if you can't beat them, join them, right? Um, driving, I basically could not drive. I could not hardly get into the car, out of the car, when I had to go various appointments. and. Um, it's only been in the last three weeks that I've felt comfortable enough to drive. But I'm much lower now in the seat of the car, three inches, so it, it makes a difference. You don't realize it till you actually start driving. And last three weeks, so you're now nine months technically post. Yeah. So it took nine months from the time of your initial severe pain. Right. Okay. Um, in terms of food preparation, well, initially... Uh, my husband has health issues of his own, so he's very limited in what he can do. So the food prep was um, a lot of um, semi-prepared or prepared stuff at the beginning. I, I ha in order to peel a potato or a carrot, I had to put both my forearms on the counter to do that and um, could not lift a dish in or out of the oven. So I can do that now one arm. Anything that's heavier than one arm that I can lift, I, I don't do. Um, and grocery shopping, I had to leave that up to my husband. Um, the walker, I had to use a walker for the first time ever in my life, and that was just to get out of bed and to the bathroom in the morning. And I haven't had to use a walker now for, again, about the last three weeks. So that's a big plus in my life. Um, clothing, well, as I said, I'm now embracing the rumpled look, but it's everything hurts around the middle. And even uh, with my bra at the back, things press on that, that bone that is protruding in, protruding in my back. So that uh, um, I have to be aware of that. So again, uh, from white to black. You probably know that this blog is listened to by both professionals and lay individuals. And so on both sides, um, that it would, they'd probably be quite interested to know what kind of therapy has helped you, what kind of things have we done together that you've found beneficial. Because when you started, you were still on a lot of uh, pretty strong medication for both handling the pain and for the muscle spasms. And um, I'm excited for you that you've come off of that medication now. 
because um, it clears the mind yes <laughs> and lets you feel like you're in control again and so I'd, if you don't mind sharing the therapies that you have found most helpful um, the best one is the uh, myofascial release it's um, it has helped with the initial spasms and then after the spasms I had these really bad vice-like grips around my right hip and that has taken that away completely um, also with the uh, the tightness in my chest I feel that I'm um, a little bit more erect I'm not I don't have that same pulling forward sensation that I had so that's really been beneficial um, the targeted um, stretches I never go a day without doing them they are really really helpful they relieve my my pain or my aches and um, they just help me with fighting this gravitational pull that I have from morning till till night. And Brenda May, you're, the stretches you're doing, um, you're holding them a lot longer than I have recommended in the book. You're holding them as a fascial stretch, correct? So yes. You'll hold them sometimes as long as 10 minutes? Yes, and it, it yeah. takes the, uh, um, the one takes the 10 minutes for my body to sort of release and relax into it. So I, I don't uh, cut back on that because it's it feels good. <laughs> um, the uh, dynamic tape is uh, another kind of little miracle worker. I couldn't believe that it actually works, but when it's not there, I can really feel the difference. And that has really helped with that long, long muscle in my back that is just, uh, um, well, so strained, basically. Um, the strengthening exercises, I think because I was uh, physically fit, more or less, before, um, my muscle memory is coming back, so every time I um, improve in my exercises, my muscles are activated, and every time those muscles are activated, I'm stronger in whatever I do, whether it's getting off the toilet or getting out of a chair, getting out of bed in one smooth motion is, is a big, big yeah. step. Can I comment on, on the exercises in regards to you being fit before? Um, and because a lot of women don't exercise until something happens and they don't have their body doesn't have a positive association with exercise but you did and so even though you sometimes the, the, the exercise that I gave you wasn't exactly what you needed and we, we would tweak it but you always could sense that oh that soreness is muscle soreness as opposed to, oh no, I have more pain or more soreness. So you always had a positive association, which I think is very important. So to, to encourage listeners to exercise on a regular basis. Yeah, so my, my uh, fitness uh, guru, as I called him, he was really very creative in his exercises, so he never, uh, we never got complacent. And so when he had us do, say, a new exercise, you could feel the difference in your body. So that's how I could identify that it was a new muscle that was being uh, used that it hadn't been before. And uh, um, the, the exercises, the strengthening exercises, uh, initially were really, really hard, even though I was fit. I mean, I could hardly lift my head up off the floor. But I did one, and then I did three, and then I did five, and then I did ten. So it's baby steps kind of progress and with my chart that I'm fastidious about I can see my progress as well which is motivating and if if you understand intellectually what what the exercise will do then I'm really motivated in terms of my everyday life so that really really has helped um, and also I use the um, um, uh, well you call them activator poles the like the Nordic walking sticks with a uh, a little weighted vest so I can now walk again. I used to walk sort of five kilometers plus a day and um, after this my initial walk was five houses <laughs> and back and that was a, exhausted me. So now I'm up to three kilometers Great. but snail's pace but I can do it with the poles and the vest because it keeps me in the proper position. Okay and just for listeners the vest that Brenda is speaking about will show later on but it is not a weighted vest um, as the ones that we would use for um, weighting ourselves down for strength training, but rather a weighted kyphoorthosis, which is more to help her counterbalance
the weight of her head and where, where her posture is taking her so that she can walk more upright. And, and I understand you're using that to do your meal preps now as well. Yeah, if I'm, uh, because I can do more than peel a carrot now, but I put it on if it takes a little longer because it just, again, helps me stay more upright because my body wants to go forward. That's the go-to position, and I, I have to fight that all the time. Okay. So, Brenda, one question that actually came from Richard, who is behind the camera all the time and, and editing everything that we do, was... And I thought it was a great question. Is what would you tell your younger self? It is a good question. And the first the first thing I would tell my younger self, and I've actually told my daughters, is that you you have to be really fastidious as, as much as you can be about choosing your general practitioner or your family doctor. He or she should be well, is your strongest advocate in the in the medical system, and they should be they should listen carefully. They should be able to communicate well to you so that if you don't understand the medical jargon, they break it down for you. Um, they should be able to answer the questions you have and to answer the questions that you don't have that you should know. Um, they, and you may have to be assertive to get your needs met. For me, that's not such an easy thing to do, but um, um, one has to stand up for one's rights. And it's their... It's their professional duty to find out if they don't know, and they won't know everything. They're a generalist, but they do have a, um, a professional obligation to find out and to send you on to a specialist who does know. And I would say, along with the, the GP, is that you should keep a copy of all tests that you have, a hard copy, uh, even in this day and age of, of uh, electronic copies, and then have a file so that you can sort of trace back your, your health history. It would save a lot of time. Um, and if you need to, when you're in really severe pain, you need to take somebody with you because the brain is fuzzy under pain and you just are not operating. The, um, the second thing I would say is um, don't be afraid to get a second opinion. You know, it, it doesn't hurt. The world's not going to fall apart. Um, if it doesn't feel right, it probably isn't right. You know your own body, and uh, that's important to follow through. Um, be bone health aware um, in terms of not just milk, but other sources of calcium as well. And, you know, especially I think in your after you've left home and mothers aren't and fathers aren't busy, you know, saying drink your three glasses of milk. You have to be your own. Um, calcium uh, conscience. And then the last one is to get fit, to be involved in exercises, but which I didn't do was, um, nor I think a lot of exercise fitness instructors, uh, I was not aware of the kinds of exercises that were detrimental to my spine. And I have to say I did them with gusto as well, so I'm now paying the price. So um, that's about it. Okay, thank you. The On the nutrition end, only because I, I hear from our listeners a lot, and just on the calcium end, um, you know, looking at more of a, an overall alkaline diet, you know, with lots of vegetables and balancing your protein, you know, and enough protein, because so many people will, will go through an exercise program, and I see it all the time, they just don't have enough protein, they don't have the building blocks. But if you have the protein which is acidic, to make sure you balance that with a good alkaline diet. So sometimes we get busy in our sessions, and I might not even have shared that with you. So just making sure that that, that information is there. Um, I know you've actually, before you even saw me, had a number of devices and braces and cushions that you um, came up with um, that helped you get through your day. And so um, if you don't mind sharing some of those, and, and we'll just do some photos of you afterwards with those. Um, but what has helped you get through the first eight months? Well, the one I have right now is like my teddy bear. Oh, okay. I, I take this wherever I go. Eyes on it. yeah. It's nice and squishy, so I put it on my, the, my spine because it absorbs po uh, shocks, potholes, and all the roads that we have in Canada. And um, even like sitting in a chair, it just it just helps as as well as a, a cushion in the lumbar area. Um, I use out in the garden, which she has right now, but doesn't want to take it out because it's it's nice and comfortable. <laughs> so that's good. Okay. The um, 
in the garden, even though I can't garden, I had to su supervise my garden girls. And uh, I wear this really heavy duty uh, lumbar support. I cannot do anything in that. I cannot bend, I cannot twist, I can't even pick up a stick. And it's there, so I don't do any of those things. I, I have to retrain my brain in terms of what is a safe way to move as opposed to what I used to, to do so easily and without thinking. I have a smaller lumbar brace that I wear um, even for things like dusting or doing the, the laundry. Again, it's not so much as, as a support as a, a reminder, don't do bad moves. Um, the little uh, weighted vest thing that uh, I, I like, I use that for walking, but I use it for food prep or anything where I'm standing around a long time, like the other day. I, my house cleaner does all the hard stuff, but I like to dust, so I wear it for that, and that just keeps me upright. It's a reminder. I also uh, use my heating pad a lot. I, uh, when I start to feel achy, I just go and sit down for 15 minutes and put it on, and um, it just helps take the ache away. And when I do my stretching exercises, I have it underneath me as well, and it, uh, it feels good. Um, I also, uh, a friend of mine loaned me her picker upper. It's, uh, it's, it's a terrific little device as long as you have it right beside you because oftentimes it was across the room and I looked at it and needed a long string. But um, it was very, very handy at the, in the initial stages because everything seems to drop when you don't want it to drop. And I think they have stuff like that even for the garden, so I was thinking of getting something like that for just sticks. Um, and then the other thing is uh, uh, now I can go grocery shopping with my husband, but some of these big box stores, you're walking football field lengths and it just is exhausting. So I lean on the, uh, the cart handle just to take some of the pressure off my back. Or sometimes I'll put my purse, I'll just swing it around and put it in my back and adjust it so it's in the small of my back. So it operates kind of like that little vest. So I think those are basically the things that I've found helpful. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Um, in regards to braces, and you have you've w used them appropriately, but for listeners, if you you know, sometimes we get used to the braces, and then we almost don't want to take them off. But they they are exactly that. They are braces, and so if you wear them or use them all the time, from the time you get up till the time you go to bed, they actually make you weaker, and that's actually been shown. So using them really appropriately, the way you're using them, you know, when tasks that, you know, you actually need reminders not to do, and you just need that extra support when out in the garden, perfect. Um, now, every person's compression fracture is going to be different. Some people will actually get compression fractures. I have a number, quite a few clients that have compression fractures that don't even know they ever had them. I'll suspect them, I'll ask them to get x-rays because I'm trying to convince them to move safer and I'll have things that will have tr triggered me to, to suspe suspect these compression fractures but they might have had a bit of back pain, a little tweak that goes after six to eight weeks. They're the lucky ones. Now their compression fractures may not always stay like that and so you might have had oh, I several of your compression mm -hmm. fractures before your travels. Yeah, I probably did and didn't know it. Yeah. And so that's just something t for people to be aware of. Um, either way, as you mentioned, you know, one of your first suggestions is to find a health practitioner that you trust, that, um, that has knowledge in osteoporosis, that's so critical, and, you know, together, you know, know that there's always light at the end of the tunnel, that there's a lot of strategies that, you know, can be tried. Um, you know, we've gone through a route that, that has given you, you know, opportunity to move better. Um, but we'll keep finding more ways and keep, you know, progressing your strength program. Um, so, although it doesn't bring you back to where you were before the compression fractures, all of these strategies can make life easier. And I, so I hope that this blog does help make the life of listeners a little bit easier out there and if anybody wants to um, add to their comments at the end of the blog feel free to do so um, thank you again Brenda you're welcome <laughs>